out of her. So how, have you, how many of y'all are ready for Christmas? I'm going to ask you that every, every uh, six days, every seven days. How many of you now have your lights up, have your, uh, your work and your list? How many of you would say you're done? I'm completely done. Okay, you have to leave. Okay, you have to, all right. Just checking. Uh, we have three candles that are lit here uh, on the Advent candle wreath. We're going to light one more candle next week, and then we're ready for uh, our Christmas Eve Eve and Christmas Eve services. So we're really excited about that. And uh, we're in a series, so I want to encourage you to grab your notes. We're going to dive right in. Uh, this is a series uh, that we have. I'm encouraging you to put your thinking caps on. We're doing a little learning uh, in this, and we're digging a little deeper. We're looking into some, some of the uh, mystery and the wonder of the Older Testament, and we're doing some learning in our scriptures uh, in this series. And we're in a series we're calling the, the series Stable Talk. We're taking a look together at some of the conversations in Holy Scripture that are announcing the good news of Jesus coming to us. And so we're, we're taking a look at those conversations as a way maybe to, to work their way into our normal, everyday garden variety conversations and lift those to another level. December is a time when you think about it that you and I can be talking about some very important things that uh, all of our lives need and uh, all of our faith finds its hope and its real grounding and foundation in. There's simply no greater news, really, than what Matthew records in, in his gospel that bears his name, Matthew 1.23. I'm going to show it on the screen. It says this, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Now, when Matthew is referring to that, he's actually speaking back into the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah, where in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, notice this, here it is. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. So we're looking at the book of Isaiah as the first stable talk conversation. And if you remember, we learned last week that prophets primarily do two things. Anybody remember what they do? Prophets, first of all, they forth tell. Say that with me. They forth tell. They speak forth rightly about things we need to hear things we need to understand, things we need to implement into our lives. Secondly, Old Testament prophets would foretell, say that, foretell, which means they would announce in advance things that were important that we needed to hear and we needed to understand. Isaiah did that, and we began last week by looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. It says, nevertheless, in the middle of this conversation, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. For in the past, he humbled himself in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee, there's the prophecy, of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Verse two, for the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And if you were with us last week, we began really primarily digging into verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah chapter 9. And what we did in looking at that, I ended with C.S. Lewis' famous quote where he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is risen, not because I see it, but because by it I can see everything else. And so we ended last week focusing on three truths that come through Isaiah's prophecy. I want to give them to you again. We're going to push them a little further this morning. Here's the first one. The world is dark. So if you're taking notes, you want to write that down. Scripture never avoids that there is darkness in our world, that there's difficulty, that there's brokenness, that there's pain, that there's tragedy. Sometimes I hear people who are outside of our faith talking about our faith as though we believe we're protected from that. And here's the thing. Jesus said, remember his famous words. He said, in this world, you will have what? Trouble. You will have trouble. But he, then he went on and he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So what we see, what we experience is not the end. There's more, more going on. So number one, this, the world is dark. Number two, Jesus is coming as the light. Jesus is coming as the light. And then number three, we will only find our way if we let him become our light. 
We will only find our way if we let him become our light. So what I want to do is I want to take that verse 2 in Isaiah 9, and I want to push that a little further. And I have to be honest with you, right at the top this morning, I really needed this talk uh, in my own life this past week. Sometimes you guys will talk to me in the lobby, and you'll say things like this. You, I don't know how you do it, but it's as though you're living in my closet. And first of all, I want to say creepy. <laughs> Second of all, I want to say I'm just not that good, but God is living in your closet. Well, that sounds a little weird too. <laughs> God knows what's going on, okay? And here's, here's the thing I want to say. I really needed that this week. I had to uh, do a funeral service for a 17-year-old boy that was shot by way of a homicide. And that was the young man that was shot in Wellington. A lot of us are following that. It's an active uh, crime investigation going on right now. And so I walked into the funeral home, and they called me earlier in the week and said, we think you're the one that needs to come and do this. And so I went to the funeral home, and I walked in, and I tell you what, um, I could not even walk through all the people. Half of Palm Beach Central High School, it looked like, was there. It was a stacked with students in there. And when you walk in there, I want to be honest, you're walking in as a human being, and I feel like people are doing this. And they're going, what on earth are you going to say that has any bearing, really, over what we're all experiencing together as a community coming together in grief? And I got to tell you, the only reason, you guys, I could stand in a room like that is because I believe what we're looking at right now. The world is dark. Jesus has come as the light. And we will only find our way if we let him become our light. See, these are not truths that we should just think about and, and, and consider idly. These are scriptures that we need to think about and the real implications of our lives in this season. And so Isaiah is telling us a very, very great thing, a very, very powerful thing. And I was thinking this past week about light. And I was thinking about um, what light actually does. The Bible says, for those walking in darkness, a light has dawned. It's come from the outside. For those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has uh, happened upon us. And I was thinking about what darkness does, and I thought of this. Maybe you want to write this down. I think of darkness, first of all, as something that dis or, or light as something that dispels darkness. Light dispels darkness. Now, it's interesting, physicists tell us that darkness is not the opposite of light. In fact, that it is a whole different substance altogether. And I think that's something for which physicists and theologians can agree, and that, and that this idea that whenever light and brightness appears, here's the thing, it eradicates darkness. It makes it go away. And so when Jesus is coming as the light, we want to understand, first of all, that he does what he does is it that he uh, eradicates the darkness in our lives. And I got to tell you, I was thinking about this because, um, you know, I, I think about this every year, especially in times of Christmas and in Easter, that I have served now as a pastor in the same location. I'm beginning my 21st year uh, here at Community of Hope. Well, I appreciate that. I didn't share that for that reason, but here's the thing I've noticed uh, after 21 years, I want to say. I have seen uh, every manner of an idea of people trying to dispel darkness in their lives through every different means possible. Uh, and about the time I think, well, I have just about seen it all, I get introduced to something else and go, well, I thought I'd seen it all, and I haven't seen it all. And uh, after 21 years, I just got to tell you, I, I, I feel like I've seen so much. And I want to tell you, here's the thing. Jesus wants to dispel the darkness in our lives. He wants to be the place where we go. The other thing I notice about uh, light, uh, light also creates warmth. Have you noticed that? Draws people to it. Uh, scientists will tell you that light unfiltered uh, creates warmth. You gather and filter light together, it becomes a laser that cuts through steel. It has an amazing power in warming things up. And that's why I believe Jesus challenged his followers to let the light shine before all people so that they could see our good works and give glory to God the Father in heaven. But here's what I really wanted us to focus on in our remaining time this morning, and it's this. Light 
illuminates direction and reveals truth. Have you noticed that? Light, by its very nature, will illuminate direction and reveal truth. I was thinking of this of several years back. Many of you have heard me mention my covenant group. And these are six other pastors that I meet with a couple times a year. We ask each other hard questions about our lives and we're accountable to one another. And we have a lot of fun doing a lot of life together. We've been to weddings of children. We've been to funerals with parents. This is kind of what we do. And uh, several years ago, our rhythm is we meet together on Sunday night and we have dinner and then we're through Wednesday morning at breakfast. So one of my friends, uh, one of in the group had... Uh, secured a place where we were going to stay in Daytona uh, Beach, and it was a house, and he sent directions. This was kind of before the GPS thing. And I drove up in my little truck that I had, and I was driving up to Daytona Beach, and it was about dark. It was getting dark, and I got lost. I know that's shocking to everybody in the room. And I couldn't find my way, and as I was driving around trying to find where I thought the house was supposed to be, this is where he said to turn and all this, all of a sudden, I noticed there were blue lights behind my car, behind my truck. And so I pulled over, and it was, you know, we all know what that's like. And I was, I was there, and I was sitting in my truck, and, and the officer, it seemed like it took him a long time to come up to my truck. And when he came up to my truck, he wasn't in any good mood at all. And he, uh, uh, you know, had the flashlight, and he looked at me, and he said, give me your registration. And I gave him the registration, and he went back to his vehicle, and he was there a long time. And then he came back up front, and he said, get out of your truck. And I thought to myself, this is not going really well. <laughs> so I got out of my truck, and I was standing beside the truck, and, and, he, and he looked at, he just kept looking at me searched around in the truck and took my license. He went back to his car. He said, you stand here and don't move. And I'm thinking, I'm not moving. <laughs> and so that went on for quite some time. I had no idea what was going on. Finally, uh, he told me it could get back in the car. And uh, what I had told him earlier, he asked me, why are you here? And when he asked me why, why I was here, I said, well, I'm here to meet a group of pastors. And I went back to his car and I was there a long time. And finally came back up and he gave me my license and he said, where are you headed? And I told him and he gave me the directions. He said, you could go. And I said, could I just ask a question? I said, what, what was all of, all of this about? And he said, well, he said, um, you looked lost. And I said, I am, I was, I am lost. <laughs> and he goes, and he said, um, and uh, you didn't have your lights on. And most of the time in Daytona, when you don't have your lights on, you're drunk. And then I asked you what you were doing, and you said you were going to meet a group of preachers. <laughs> and I knew you were drunk. <laughs> True story. But think with me about what light is supposed to do. I'm not sure why I shared that. Light illumines direction and reveals truth. Now, here's what I believe about many of us in this room. You are trying to find your direction through the wrong source. And I want to call it out to you. And some of us are here, and if we were very honest, here's what I, I think many of you would say this. My life tends toward darkness. Things are unclear and often confusing and here's why. You're not walking in the light of Christ. And he has come and he has made a way for you. But there's something going on in your life and you're resisting that. And here's what I want to tell everybody in the auditorium and everybody listening to me online. Stop that. Allow Jesus to become your light. And he will lead you to truth. And he will illuminate what's dark in your life and you will see it more clearly and you will be able then to distance yourself and step away from it. But the decision is solely yours to make. And so when I think about this powerful verse and the reason I wanted to break it into two weekends is because uh, in verses one and two primarily, uh, we are learning uh, primarily about 
the light. We might remember what John the Beloved wrote in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, when he says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now look at this. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet we choose to walk in the darkness, we lie. And we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, look at that, with one another. And the blood of his son purifies us from sin. This is what you're craving if you move toward the light. Many of you remember the old story that I used to share. Uh, it's one of my favorites, so I share it and pull it out every now and again about my favorite uh, preacher in South Georgia that told the story of growing up on a farm and when he was young, as a little boy, his dad would ask him sometimes to go retrieve things from the barn, and he was afraid the first time he went to do it. His dad, dad took him out on the front porch, and he gave him a lantern, and he said, I want you to go to the barn and grab the rake and the hoe and bring that back to me. And he said, Dad, I don't want to do it. It's dark over there. And he said, I want you to take the lantern and do that. And he goes, I want you to walk as far as the light will take you. And he gave him the light, and he said, how far do you see? He said, Dad, I could see to the well. He said, walk to the well. And he started calling to him from the front porch. He goes, now what you can see? He said, I can see to the fence post. He said, walk to the fence post. And we got to the fence post. He said, how far can you see? He said, I can see to the barn. He said, walk to the barn. And see, that's what God is asking and inviting us into. Even through his word, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. He wants to be the light, but here's the question I want to leave you with this morning. We might consider this morning, how does he become our light? I want to tell you, and the answer to that is in verses six and seven of Isaiah chapter nine. And the Bible tells us in what is maybe the most popular verse of scripture in all of the book of Isaiah, he says this, for to us a child is born and a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will, be, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. How does he become our light? He becomes our light when we let him become, first of all, not just our counselor, our wonderful counselor. Think with me for a moment about what a counselor does. When you and I are going through something that's challenging, often it's good to talk to someone uh, who is associated with, we're associated with, who has traveled the same path we have gone through, but who has done so successfully. And that's what Jesus has done. Jesus spanned heaven and came to earth and was tempted in every possible way as we have been, except the Bible says, without sin. So he succeeded at it, and now he becomes our advocate in heaven. He's our, not only our counselor, he's our wonderful counselor. I think of this uh, in this way because in so many ways, he entered in. Now, I don't know about you, a lot of us watch commercials at the Super Bowl. I wanna tell you when I watch commercials, I watch commercials at Christmas time. I don't know about you. It's a diversion from the Hallmark Channel that's playing 24 seven in my house. (laughs) And I have to get out of it. And there's this commercial right now. I don't even know what it is. I think it's a, a internet commercial or whatever. Uh, uh, and and um, it's about this young family with this young girl who is gonna go to grandma and granddad's house. Have you seen it? Can I just, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna get mail over this. It's sappy. The first time I saw it, I got literally choked up when I watched it. And it's like the girl, she says, she writes out on Facebook, she's going to grandma and grandpa's house. And it's like, she's, she said, I'm entering into the gates of hell. There's no internet. And grandma reads the story and she sees that and they tune their game up. And the little granddaughter comes in the house and here's granddad, he's got, you know, he's yelling at the TV. It's, it's got voice command and all that. And the look on her face is like, my grandparents have entered the 21st century. And I just see that, and it's just this beautiful picture of them entering into her world. Can I just tell you that's what Jesus has done for us? I, I, a, a essayist Dorothy Sayers, British essayist, writes this. 
The incarnation means that for whatever reason, as the world is imbued with sorrow and death and failure, God has nonetheless had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine, showing us that he can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He himself has gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life, the cramping restrictions of hard work, the lack of money, the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death, He's born into poverty and suffered infinite pain, all for us. And he thought all the while it was worth his while to do so. I mean, there it is. Wonderful counselor. Now watch this. He becomes our light if we let him be our mighty God and everlasting father. You know what I think about when I think about those phrases? He he just, he moves the tent stakes out. Before he came, all of our conversation was horizontal. It was never vertical. And Jesus invites us into a conversation that spans space and time. December is a time we need to be reminded of that. This is why our church is hosting things like Blue Christmas in our Christmas rotation. Because a lot of us, we just, we're soft in December. Are you? I am sometimes. I miss some people. I got some things going on. And I'm reminded in this moment that we serve a God who gets it, who remembers too, who is with us. He wants to be our Prince of Peace. And we can walk in his light because he's our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. He's our everlasting Father, and he's our Prince of Peace. And when it says Prince of Peace, it means Prince, it communicates the idea of preeminence. It's where we go above every place else. See, it's kind of interesting. This is the kind of thing, we we were singing it this morning, born a child and yet a king. I'll leave you with one other challenge. I started to notice every time in the Gospels when people encountered Jesus and they encountered the wonderful truth that he offers to us, think of this for a moment. They were never indifferent to it, not one time. They never received the the news mildly. Oh, he's nice. I should think about him. What a nice guy Jesus is. You never read that in the Bible. Here's what I notice. They really basically, everybody who encounters him, they fall into one of three categories. They were fearful. They were furious. Or they did this. And they worshiped him. Can I submit to you Those are your only options. Fearful, furious, or you worship him. And my prayer and my hope through this season, you will invite him to be your light. You will invite him to forgive your sin. You'll invite him to be your Lord. And I want to tell you when you do that, you are going to find yourself on your knees worshiping him as he deserves to be worshiped. Lord, these are our prayers. This is what we bring to you. I pray that in this season of wonder and excitement that you would not allow us to be mild or indifferent to what you have accomplished for us that we might strip away all of the religion and see it in new and fresh and important ways. And that, God, you might enter into our lives and be our light to dispel the darkness, to create warmth, and to illuminate direction and reveal truth. This is our prayer. And now, oh God, as we reflect on this, would you
you hear our prayers and be honored by our worship. For we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. The altar's open. Will you come to fill that team?
us to look anywhere else. We have found you. It is you. You are the one. And so, God, we just pray in this moment that we would restore you in so many ways to the rightful place that you belong, which is to be the king of our hearts, to be our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, our Forgiver, our Friend. So God, I pray for all of this community this morning, listening online and in this auditorium, that if we've not done that, that we would do that in this humble and reverent moment, that we would make you the Lord of our lives, and that we would walk toward your light. I'm fully convinced you will guide us out of darkness. You will warm up our cold lives, and you will illumine truth and direction. We ask you to do it. We believe you can. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Give the Lord a round of applause. God is so good.